we have about five pieces of tax guidance from the IRS. We don't have any legislation that has passed specific to tax. We do have the infrastructure bill, which talked about information reporting, but again, in and of itself, that's not a tax bill. Um, but the information that we do have that we can rely upon is about two pieces of guidance. So there's no 2014-21 and revenue ruling 2019-24. So the two takeaways from those two pieces of guidance, which were published in the Internal Revenue Bulletin, which is why we can rely upon them, the other pieces of guidance were not published, and therefore, although they're not authoritative and can't be relied upon, they still, still should be considered. But the Notice 2014-21 gives us the property tax treatment of these assets. So across the board, no matter what type of token we're talking about, generally we look at these as property. So when I say that, I mean the general property tax rules apply. We wouldn't consider it currency. So if you are transferring into or outside of an asset, either between two types of asset classes or back out into fiat or um, some sort of government-backed currency, you're going to have a taxable event there. That's from the notice 2014-21. Then from Revenue Rule 2019-24, we have the dominion and control test, which tells us when do we have income recognition when we receive these assets. So not just purchasing, but let's say you have an airdrop or if there's a, a hard fork, like Ethereum, Ethereum Classic, or Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash. Um, there's also a CCA on that as well, but again, it's not authoritative guidance. It was just an example that was provided, and that was in 2021. Uh, but the relevant parts of these really go back to, even though we don't have specific guidance in a lot of areas, we can look at these overbroadening principles and apply them to today. Um, to your question on the market, how things are going at the moment, there is a lot of volatility going on. So thinking about, if you're in a, in a leveraged position and there's a margin call, you might have assets that are gonna be liquidated and being concerned about that because if your cost basis in the asset that's being liquidated on a margin call is lower than the fair market value on the day of liquidation, you have a taxable event at that moment because that is a disposition of a piece of property. So it's treated as a sale. So even though you've now lost your tokens, you might still have capital gain tax associated with that. One way to combat that would be one, don't get margin called if you can avoid it, right? So right, being exactly. your risk tolerance within your fund, right? To so not get over leverage. Exactly, exactly. Right. It's really based on risk tolerance of, of your strategy and being mindful of the consequences of being on the more risky side versus the more conservative side and where you really want to land and where are your LPs comfortable. Fund managers should be thinking about how are their documents drafted currently? What is the expectation from their LPs perspective on when the market downturns? If you have substantial appreciation in your assets, you had a, a realization event early on in the year. So let's say you, you entered into an amazing trade, you had a large gain, you sold that asset for the large gain, but you never went back out into fiat. You maintain different positions and different types of, of cryptos. And then we have a market that we have right now where the market downturns. Just because the asset class had a downturn in the market doesn't eliminate those gains that you recognize earlier on in the year. So you want to be thinking about, do, does the fund have reserves to cover the potential tax bill that you're passing on to your LPs? Are your LPs, do they have an expectation of receiving a distribution to help cover their taxes? Most of the PPMs will talk about this, whether there's a required distribution or not, if you have side letter agreements. These are all things you really need to be reviewing and looking at when we have a market that we do have. And one way to combat if you have a large gain or realized gain early in the year is tax loss harvesting. So there's a code section 1091, and that specifically excludes, what, it's called the wash sale rules, which excludes the ability to enter position, exit it to, uh, to harvest the loss, as they say, and then entering right back into it within a 30-day window. So it's 30 days um, prior and 30 days looking forward. So really it's a 60-day period. But that applies to securities. And as I said, in notice 2014-21, we know that these this class is property, but we don't know what type of property. We don't have any specific guidance that says securities or commodities. So because from, again, just a purely tax perspective, we don't generally view these as securities. We don't believe that the wash sale rules currently apply. Therefore, you can have tax loss harvesting to offset earlier gains in a market like now when you have a downturn in the values, getting out of the position and entering back into the position to help, help your LPs because they're really going to be the ones paying that tax when it flows out of the fund. So generally speaking, when you're dealing with staking, we don't have any specific guidance. We do have specific guidance re with regard to mining rewards, and that's, again, Notice 2014-21 talks about if you are a miner and you're earning mining rewards, that's taxable income upon receipt. We also have that dominion and control test, which I talked about in Revenue Rule 2019-24. So based off of those two aspects, you can have the argument that if you are a, a staker and you're validating, when you actually have dominion and control over those staking rewards, that's the moment that you have income recognition at the full fair market value, which would be ordinary income. 
there's another argument that says, well, no, and some people would take this position. It's not income at the time that it is earned. It's income at the time that you sell it. So there's a, a current case, the Jarrett case, that's still sort of ongoing. And that's also up, up for a little bit of argument as well. That says this is really more created property. So created property is not ca a capital asset. So you would still have ordinary income. It just wouldn't be until you actually sold the asset. That's an interesting position. I, I understand where, where the uh, POSA is actually the one kind of backing that, that case right now. Currently, the IRS did issue the refund to the taxpayers, but that's not guidance that we can rely upon. From, from my perspective as a tax attorney, it's a net nothing. We still have uh, income recognition under 61, dominion control tests, and the, and the mining guidance that we generally are looking to for staking rewards. But I do understand the position that they're trying to take. So right now, I would say, no, we have no changes to staking. It, it kind of is what it is. It depends on your tax advisor. It depends on your risk tolerance, what position you want to go with. Uh, so just having that conversation is going to be really important. I've been in the space for quite a while. Uh, since 2016, I've been advising clients. I've seen uh, bull markets. I've seen bear markets. Uh, th this one is it, a little bit more aggressive maybe than ones in the past, but it, it's not to me, not that different. It's just, again, risk tolerance, making sure that you have that open communication with your LPs. If you're going to change your strategy due to the market uh, issues that are going on, making sure you're having that conversation with your advisors, including your tax advisors and your attorneys, there might be strategies that we can help you implement into what you're doing to reduce any tax burden. If you tell us after you've already done it, there's a lot less room for tax planning. So just making sure that if you're changing your strategy based on what's going on today, have that conversation with your advisor just to see if there's anything we can do to help.